morning, everybody. Welcome to Agape Christian Worship, the English ministry here at CBC COC. We're glad you're all here with us this morning, uh, in person and online. Good morning. Uh, so yeah, um, I think today's message is about like seasoning your conversation with salt or something like that, something along those lines. Kind of hard to pick songs about that. There's not really songs about uh, seasoning our speech with salt. But weirdly, I was kind of thinking about, (laughs) stay with me here, if I was like trying to talk to somebody and I'm like, if I was like in a musical and I broke out into song, like what songs were simple enough and clear enough in terms of their message that like, if I were to sing it to them, they would like get a picture or glimpse of the gospel. So that's kind of where these songs came from, but yeah kind of weird, but that's just what I was thinking with Seizing with Salt, like if I broke out into a musical. But yeah, we're going to uh, open up in a word of prayer, and we're going to sing some songs together. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for who you are and what you've done for us. Uh, I pray that as we sing to you, as we worship you, um, individually and together as one voice, as one church, that you would be given all the glory, that you would be our sole focus, and that all glory, honor, and praise would be given to you this morning. Lord, if we come in here um, with distractions, maybe a little rushed, I pray that we would set all that aside, and again, that we would give you our full focus, and that we would give you our best offering this morning. We love you, and in Jesus' name, amen. If you're... um, If you're able and willing, would you stand with us as we sing? Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest. The vilest, the poor, our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morning, our sins, they are many. We could never afford Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Praise the 
the splendor of the king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light in the darkness strives to Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me. How great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. to age he stands and time is in his hands beginning and the end beginning and the end the Godhead three in one Father, Spirit, Son in awe of you this morning in your presence of how good you are of just what you've done for us for saving us for giving us new life and purpose I pray that we would have a heart and a burden to share that with others I pray that as we continue to hear your word and to fellowship with one another that you would be given all the glory and honor and praise we love you and in Jesus name amen once again, good morning. We're glad you're all here with us this morning. And as you sit, please greet one another. A good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Daryl. I am the English pastor here, and it's... It's great to be singing a golden oldie this morning. I like that. So we want to welcome everyone here and those also online. We have a couple of things. Uh, we have our tithes and offering, and you know, it's a privilege to give give to the Lord. So for those you know, that you're, if you're here, there's a black box behind in the back there. We also also can give online. 
And so we just want to pray for those tithes and offering, right, if you would. Let's pray together. Lord, we're just so thankful. Oh, gosh. There's so much that you give to us. How can we not give back to you? So, Lord, we ask that you take these, what we have, we give to you, multiply it for your kingdom. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a couple of things. If you want all the goodies about what's going on in this church, go for that QR code right there. And um, if you want a weekly email, you can, you can um, text or email uh, mark.quang at cbccoc.org, and he will give you all these. He will send to you every Friday all these goodies, okay? So a couple of things. Today, we have worship. We're here. Refreshments. Now, look at me now here, okay? Refreshments are this way. Do not go that way. Go this way. So we'll take care of the chairs. And we're going out this door. And we're going into the room 101, okay? It's the one that's right across the way. And then after that, we have our One Life small groups. If you're not in a One Life small you're still not too late to get into one. We have, we have extra books. We have books for you, uh, our journals for you, actually, and you can be a part of this. And then we have lunch. And then don't forget that one, on Wednesday, we have a One Life prayer meeting. So we'll get together and pray uh, as partners to get there for, together for your one life, okay? All right. We also have a blood drive. You can see that there. Again, it, this is all on the email. Or actually, you know, on our, on our website, we have a bulletin link. So you can look on that too. But we have a, a red blood drive. And so if you're interested in that, make, make note of the dates, okay? And then we also are doing that once a month, our church is going out to the neighborhood, surrounding neighborhoods, so in February this month, we're going to this location here, Lakeview Senior Center, okay? So last time they, um, we had it, it was uh, January, and about uh, 20 of us came out, something like that. But I think about 60 people were there, so it was kind of cool, around, from around the neighborhood. So if that's something you want to be a part of, you go ahead and sign up. Information's on the bulletin. And also, if now there's a missions conference. This is at Gateway Seminary. That mean, what, what does that mean, Gateway Seminary? Well, the Southern Baptists, who we, which we are part of, um, part of our offering goes to something called the Cooperative Fund. So think about this. You have all these thousands of churches um, giving a little bit to this big fund. Now, this fund um, helps us support missionaries. It also supports six seminaries. So we have six seminaries on the Southern Baptist. So Gateway is one of those. It's Ontario. And if you want to go to this one, it's going to it's on the bulletin. I know this is a little bit small, but it's going to be like most of the day, and, you, and you'll get some training on, on missions, okay? Oh, by the way, if you sign up um, with Edward Chow, uh, he'll hit, get you on the list. And if you uh, want to go, our, we have church training budget. We'll pay for you to go, and it includes lunch. All right, baptism. If you're interested in baptism and or membership, um, Come talk to the pastors or the ministers here, and we'll let, we can set you up on how to, how to do that, okay? All right. With that, we got Minister Mark. Thanks, Pastor Daryl. All right. Good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? Staying dry, I hope. So um, usually the, the device I bring up here with me is an iPad 2, and I think we're on like 8 or... You know, somewhere there. So I'm pretty behind. And every time I leave my iPad 2 unplugged, which I did this past week, it just dies. It just no battery. So I apologize for using my laptop this morning. I hope it doesn't block too much of the view. But uh, I'm going to be using this for kind of the structure of it. But I'll probably step away a little bit too. But I just want to wish you a good morning and hope that everybody had a blessed week. Um, welcome to our third week in our One Life Churchwide campaign. I hope you've been enjoying our Sunday school small groups and going through the different activities in our workbooks. Um, just a reminder that One Life is all about the opportunity to pray about and think about people in your life that you want to share Jesus with. And I think the moment that we hear that, and this is the case for me sometimes too, the moment we hear that, we kind of get a little bit fearful. We get a little bit scared because naturally we don't, feel comfortable sometimes bringing up Jesus or bringing up Christianity to those that are close to us. We're concerned that maybe 
Our friendship will um, lessen or be awkward if we bring that conversation up. Or maybe that we'll get rejected or we don't know what to say if somebody keeps asking us questions. And this is why we really came together and started this One Life campaign is so that we can actually become trained and we, be we can become comfortable and used to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with people around us. And that is such an important part, a central part of our faith and our church's mission. So I hope it's been a blessing to you. And today we're starting week number three of four. And just a brief recap of where we at. In week one, we talked about why sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is a crucial part of our mission as a church and as a Christian, and how before we even set foot into the mission field, we need to stop, pray, and ask God for help. We need to pray for opportunities to have these conversations with the people that God has placed in our lives. And in week two, we spent some time thinking about how to build friendships with other people, how to be bridge builders, peacemakers. And we identified people within our spheres of influence this past week in our workbooks, people who can potentially have spiritual conversations with us and us with them. We thought about that. We thought about our families, our friends, our coworkers, the people on our college campuses, our school campuses. There's people that God intentionally placed in our lives. And today, this week, which is week three, we'll be focusing on how to cultivate conversations with other people. We want to have effective spiritual dialogue with the people around us and with our one lives, but also just with people in general. You see, this campaign is not just for you to get used to thinking about people in your life who need to know Jesus. Throughout your life, you're going to meet probably dozens, hundreds maybe, of people who are not Christian, where this will come in handy, to be in this mindset of praying for them, of being careful with how you speak and how you have conversations with those individuals so that instead of being turned away from God, you actually help be part of the process of turning them towards God. This morning's message is called Salt the Conversation, which is why there are two salt shakers above those two people having a conversation because the Bible actually talks about the importance of seasoning your words, seasoning your speech with salt. And we're going to be looking at two verses to kind of explain that. But before we jump into that, I want to tell you a little bit about how important words are. And not even just in conversation or in relationships, but in general, in the Bible, in creation. If you remember in Genesis, in the very beginning of the Bible, we see that God created everything. Through speech, he spoke the world into existence. When he said, let there be light, there was light. So words are important to God. He created them for a reason. They were the means in which he created everything. In the Gospel of John, in the very beginning, we see that the word became flesh in the person of Jesus. And in front of us, when we open up our Bibles, we see that we have God's word opened up to us because Scripture is God's spoken word to us, and Scripture, through Scripture, God speaks to us. Since words existed, they have not ceased to influence relationships, both in positive and in negative ways. If you think back to the Garden of Eden, we know that Satan tempted Adam and Eve to sin through his deceitful words. And yet also using words, Jesus called his disciples to follow him. So using words once again. The book of James has a whole section dedicated to talking about the impossibility of taming the tongue. The impossibility of always being a, a master of, in control of the words that we say 100% of the time. In chapter 3, verses 7 to 10, he says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. What James is saying here is that it's so kind of ridiculous that humanity 
has successfully tamed every sea creature, no matter how small or how big, we've tamed it. We've succeeded in doing that and maintaining dominion and control over it. However, this tiny little muscle that sits inside your mouth, we have not tamed. We just can't do it. It's an impossibility. And it sounds so silly, but it's true, isn't it? And you and I know this well. Sometimes we can be so careless with the words that come out of our mouths. He's saying that one moment we're praising God and singing to him on a Sunday morning like today. We're singing these songs. We're having good conversation. And then the moment we hop into the car to go home, the first thing we do is maybe start making fun of how somebody dressed today or start spreading rumors about somebody else in the congregation. And we just switch immediately from godly talk to gossip and rumors. And James is acknowledging that this is the reality of how we use our tongue sometimes and that it's unacceptable to have that behavior. This is why it's so important for us to know how to speak, how to have conversation with each other and with other people, especially when we're trying to share Jesus with those around us. If you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, which is going to be the first of our two verses that we're going to be looking at this morning together. And let's see what Peter has to say about conduct in conversation about how we should behave. I'll have it up here on the slide as well if you want to read. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he says, Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Here, Peter tells us to be prepared to make a defense. And an important question to ask ourselves is, Make a defense against what? When we use that word defense, we usually mean a way to defend ourselves from attack or from somebody who's looking to kind of get through our defenses, right? That's when we talk about defense, almost warfare, language of warfare. And he brings to our attention that throughout our lives, there are going to be people. There are going to be unbelievers, people who are not Christian, people who don't know Christ, who will inevitably question why we are the way that we are. Why do you go to church every week? Why do you go to small groups? Why do you read this Bible all the time? Why are you in prayer during your lunch hour? Whatever questions they have, Peter acknowledges that there's going to be people in your life who are going to come to you with questions. And sometimes they'll simply just be curious about why you have hope when things seem hopeless or why you have peace with uncertainty. But in other times, these individuals who approach you or who question you will do so in a hostile way. They'll want to pick a fight. They'll want to get you angry. They want to get you riled up. But no matter the manner in which you're being approached or challenged, we see from this verse that we must do it as God instructed us to do. That no matter what that conversation looks like, you have to maintain gentleness and respect. In other words, how we make a defense of our faith matters just as much as the testimony, as the witness that we give to the people around us. There are going to be times where you may feel justified in condemning or insulting those who question your faith, especially when they are coming to you from that angle. But we see here that that's not what God calls us to do, is it? We have to set aside the temptation to be bitter, or to be insulting, or to be harsh for the sake of winning somebody over for the gospel. I want to tell you kind of an interesting story where I encountered those feelings of, of bitterness and dismissiveness and harshness when encountered with somebody who is not a believer, as I was at the time. See, back in 2016, I moved to Orange County here from the Bay Area to start my degree program at Fuller Theological Seminary. And the first place I visited once I came to Irvine was William R. Mason Regional Park. Has anybody been there? It's right next to UCI. Really nice park. And I didn't actually plan on going there as I drove down from Northern California. I drove by it, and I looked at it, and I thought it was a nice place to stop 
to take some time to pray and meditate before I began my seminary journey, because I was transitioning from healthcare graduate school into seminary, a really big transition, so I just needed time to stop, slow down, and pray. Well, it turned out it wasn't a good place to stop, because the first thing I saw when I pulled up is that parking cost $5. <clears throat> And um, I wasn't happy with that. And I was the only car in the lot. Uh, so that was weird. But I decided to do it. I paid the $5. And since I was new to the area, I didn't know if there were any alternatives to the $5 parking at William R. Mason. But in all seriousness, it was truly a beautiful place and a peaceful place to pray and prepare myself for what was to come over the next four, maybe five years. So I took a couple of laps around the park just, you know, praying, listening to worship music, spending time with God. And eventually I found this bench that I sat at to kind of just continue my time in prayer, to bow my head silently and pray. And I don't know how this happened, but somehow when I opened my eyes from that prayer, I realized that two people had actually snuck up on me as I was sitting there praying. Kind of crazy, right? It's kind of scary. And I looked up, and there are two people right in front of me. Mormon missionaries. <laughs> and Mormon missionaries' sisters, actually. I know a lot of times we see the brothers going around doing missions, but the sisters, I don't see as much. And this is the first time I actually encountered them as sisters. I believe only like 20% of them um, are, are women that are Mormon missionaries. So a pair of them just show up. And they were walking towards me, and it was clear, I could see it in their eyes, that they had locked on to me as a target. Just, I was in their cross here, and they're about to take that shot. And I don't know if this is a sign for me to just not pursue pastoral ministry anymore. Like, this is not for me. You know, I'm feeling freaked out. Or this is a sign saying that you should move forward with seminary. But I was kind of at a crossroads here. I didn't have a lot of time to think because they kind of caught me by surprise. But my immediate response in my heart was thinking about the impression that I had kind of grown over the years of anybody who's not in the Christian faith is that this is going to be uncomfortable. They don't believe the same thing that I do. They're different from me. So my responsibility as a Christian to defend my faith is to burn that bridge down, is to reject them, is to not even entertain any sort of conversation and just send them on their way. And I've done that before. Before this moment, I've done that. I want it to be dismissive, to say something clever I'm not interested, or maybe something even more disrespectful so that they can just move along on their way. And plus, at that point, I've already done some research on Mormonism, and I really did not want to have anything to do with them. I saw them as just people that were not worthy of my time. But in that moment, and I believe this is from the Lord because that was not my natural inclination when I first saw them, I believe that God started to soften my heart towards them, even just a little bit. And he reminded me that I have an important role to play in this whole interaction. I mean, if you think about it, how many Christians did they know at the time? Did they know any Christians? Has anybody ever ministered the true gospel to them in their lives? And they're both pretty young, maybe just out of high school. Probably no Christians in their lives. So ultimately, I decided to take some time to talk with them and get to know them a little bit better. And even though we're talking about conversation this morning, something that's important is also knowing when not to speak, the importance of listening, of hearing people out, of understanding where they are. So one thing that God really put on my heart to do in that situation, even though I had a lot of things I wanted to say in my mind, was just to listen. Because God reminded me of the importance of doing these conversations with gentleness and with respect, no matter who they are, no matter what they're bringing to the table. So through our conversation, I want to unpack, you know, every part of it, but basically I got to share my faith with them too, and they shared theirs with me as well. And we had a civil and an honest conversation about some of the differences that exist between Christianity and Mormonism. But the win, the big win that we had in our conversation was that we never once yielded to aggression or unloving behavior, even though it was tempting, even though there were moments where it's easy just to, you can't wait to pull the rug under their feet and just completely debunk something they're saying. 
we did not yield to unloving behavior. I did not yield to unloving behavior. And I'm thankful for that because I believe there is a bridge built there through that type of conversation. The last thing as I kind of close the story and walk away from it is that before we parted ways, they asked if they could take a picture with me, like kind of like a selfie, because they shared that they had just moved out of state to California. There, one was from Arizona, one was from, I think, like Idaho or something like that. Um, and they had just moved to Irvine. And they said, I'm the very first person that they ever talked to um, on their, their new kind of goal to become missionaries. And I thought that was so interesting because they were the first person I talked to, too, once I moved down to Irvine. So we kind of had that common ground. It was kind of fun. Um, so now they have me in their database. I'm sure I'm still, you know, maybe later this afternoon I'll get a visit from these sisters. But either way, it was a memorable and an eventful first day in Irvine for me. God taught me how to have conversations with gentleness and respect. And maybe as I'm sharing that story, you are thinking of moments where maybe your knee-jerk reaction was to condemn or to criticize somebody who's not the same as you just because they don't know Jesus. That is opposite of how God wants us to operate. He wants us to be people that can be trusted, to have words that matter and that can be loving, that really make God attractive to them, not somebody who wants nothing to do with them. So that's so important to keep in our minds. This gentleness and this respect is mandatory, in other words, when we have conversation with people. And this kind of conduct does honor God because we're being obedient to what First Peter is saying. Okay, now let's turn over to Colossians. We're going to look at Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. And this one is written not by Peter, but written by Paul. And Paul writes this letter to the church in Colossae, which is why it's called Colossians. And uh, let's go ahead and look at this verse, these two verses here. He's still talking about conversation. He says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We see clearly in verse 5, the first one, that Christians are to be wise in the way that we converse with outsiders. And what does he mean by outsiders here? In the Greek, it means that those who are away or those who are without. Paul is talking about unbelievers here, once again, like we talked about in Peter, non-Christians, those existing outside of the church who may at some point in your life confront you or challenge you about your faith. So it's the very same context that we just talked about in that verse in Peter. And just like that verse, Paul recognized that there's always going to be people. There's always going to be people put around you who are watching you, watching your, the church, watching people who profess to be Christian, who claim to follow Jesus. People are watching us to make sure and to see whether or not we actually measure up to the things that we teach, seeing if we're actually walking the walk, if we're actually practicing what we preach. And I think that's purposeful. It's almost a way to keep us accountable to the things that we learn on Sunday morning or the things that we read in Scripture. And what Paul is saying is that we need to be smart in the way that we interact with non-Christians because what we do and what we say can determine whether or not they turn towards the Lord or whether they turn away. So it's that same concept there. And let me ask you a question to kind of get the juices flowing here about this concept. When an unbeliever hears you talk, when a non-Christian hears you talk, what do they hear from you? Do they hear judgment? Do they hear criticism, anger, or even slander? How do you behave in those conversations? Are you yielding to that aggression and that hostility? You see, Paul is warning us not to be unkind or quick with the way that we use our words, the way that we talk. But also, we have to maximize. He says, making the best use of the time. We have to maximize every opportunity we have to evangelize. You see, with those Mormon sisters, I only had maybe, I was actually pretty long, like three hours conversation. <laughs> but uh, it's limited. I've never seen them again. What are you going to choose to do in maybe the 10 minutes that you have with somebody who doesn't know Jesus? Somebody you may never see again. 
What can you do to capitalize on that opportunity that God gives you? We have to be mindful of that. We have to be always thinking about that when we're talking to other people. However, one of the most notable aspects of this passage gives us the name of our message this morning, seasoned with salt. What does that mean to season your speech with salt? Well, during Paul's time, salt was primarily used as a preservative to keep something pure, to preserve something for long periods of time, something like meat or maybe even fruit or something else. Uh, It purifies food. And of course, like how we use it today, salt is used as a flavor enhancer. It makes something tastier or more palatable. So he's using this kind of as an illustration to show us how every time that we talk, every time we have a conversation with somebody, we need to make sure that we flavor our conversation with salt. We need to season our words with it. When we salt it, we add flavor to it, which makes it more tasty, more appetizing and palatable to the person that we're talking to. Now, one thing I want to make absolutely clear is that this doesn't mean that we compromise or we change the gospel, that we walk away from the truths that we read in Scripture and the truths that we're bound to as Christians. Paul doesn't, did not do that either. He didn't move away from the truth in these conversations. But it does mean that a lot of the time when we're talking to other people, we have to change the way that we approach or navigate these conversations for the sake of winning somebody over to Christ. And it may look like speaking words of encouragement, speaking words of peace, of hope, no matter where the other person is at, listening to maybe the struggles or the burdens or the things that the person wants to share with you. That's why listening is so important. It might look like those things. We have to speak in a way that helps them understand the gospel that was transformative for us and is now the gift that we want to give other people. This way, there may actually be a desire for people to talk to you and to turn towards God. Through those conversations, they learn more about this Jesus that we claim to follow. If we season, if we salt our words with flavor and seasoning. When I think of something salty, the first thing that comes to mind is chips, which I happen to greatly enjoy. And one thing that I've observed over my lifetime is that you can never have just one. When you open up that bag, you take one, you're already hooked. You're already digging into that bag, and next thing you know, the bag is gone. And it's interesting because I am convinced that food scientists maybe at Frito-Lay, for example, have determined the ideal amount of salt to put into their products so that every time you eat one, it's just enough flavor and just enough seasoning for you to want to get another chip. That's what makes it just so alluring, right? You just cannot have one. If we properly flavor our words as Christians, perhaps that one life that we've been praying for these past couple weeks will want to know more about God. If you flavor your words properly, maybe they'll want to take another bite or ask another question or make another comment that will help them learn more about Jesus. The salt that Paul is talking about here, which sits right before he says seasoned with salt, is to always be gracious. The salt of grace. We must let our words be full of grace at all times, no matter what. That's something that we universally have to put on. And I know that this is hard to do. All of us do this imperfectly. That's why James talks about how hard it is to tame the tongue. Because sometimes we do fall into that temptation to insult or to be right or win the conversation. But every time you talk to somebody, especially somebody who's not a Christian, I encourage you to remember the importance of seasoning your words with grace. Because that's how God interacts with his people. We're reflecting that. We're mirroring that behavior. God is patient with us. He's full of grace when he waits for us, when he picks us back up. So how much more do we need to pass on that grace to other people who need that too? If you have the salt of grace with your words, you'll always know how to answer each person. And God can use it to reveal himself to someone through you. One conversation 
at a time. Kind of a final wrap-up diagram for us this morning. We learn about how it's important to season your conversation with salt, specifically the salt of gentleness and respect, as we saw in 1 Peter, and also the salt of wisdom and grace, as we saw just now in Colossians. Brothers and sisters, let's get into the habit of salting our conversations with all of these things. That no conversation that we have is without this seasoning that we have been encouraged to add today. Salt your conversation so that the person you're talking to cannot help but want to take another chip from that bag, to ask another question, because they have this curiosity, this newfound hunger to learn more about God through you. The amazing thing, though, however, is that even though Paul talks about seasoning with salt, Jesus takes it a step even further. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says famously, that you are the salt of the earth. It's not just about salting the things that you say, it's actually who you are. You have a role in preserving godly culture in a dark and broken world. You have a role in flavoring culture and those that you interact with for the sake of the gospel. So it's not just about how we talk to people, it's everything. It's your entire life, your entire life is salt, which means that as Christians, we won't be effective in our witness if we just sit within our church's four walls and let our salt simply accumulate decade after decade that passes by. Because there are people outside, as we saw in our verses today, outside the church who are right now struggling to find hope in their lives, the hope that we have as believers We have to refuse to be content with that truth, that there's people who have yet to be saved outside our church. That's not something that should make us happy. God is not pleased when his people just sit around and talk about themselves, amongst themselves, day in and day out, all day long. That's why we're the salt of the earth. It means that you have to go. You have to move beyond our stockpile of salt and share that with other people, so that others can taste and see the goodness of God. And the amazing thing is that this was God's plan for his people, was for the church to be messengers of this hope as a means to give this free gift of the gospel to the people that he has intentionally placed in your life, so that others can have it too. And the truth is that requires action. It requires movement. At this point in time, especially if you've been joining us during our Sunday School small groups with One Life, you have written down the names of people in your life that you would like to share Jesus with. And this week, I challenge you to have a conversation with each of them. Every single name that you wrote down, whether it's through a Zoom call, a phone call, a text, or even in person if they're nearby. But don't just have any conversation. Have a conversation that is seasoned with gentleness, respect, wisdom, and with grace. Just the right amount of each one so that the person that you've been praying for, the person that you're going to talk to, can see the God that you serve and taste his goodness through the words that you say. If you salt your words, you will speak with the fullness of God's love and truth. Something that a lost soul who longs for him cannot help but stop and notice in your conversation. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful that even though you could have come down and just shared the gospel yourself with every single person that you wanted to come to you and to your family, You have instead called us, your people, to participate in that work that is making a difference in the world because the world still exists with a lot of people that do not have hope. And Lord, I don't see the verse in Scripture that says to be selfish with our faith, to to tell us that, oh, now that you have Jesus, this is just for you. 
Forgive us for the times, Lord, when maybe fear or obstacles prevent us from sharing this with other people. Let us not be a church that's content with people outside who do not know you yet. God, use us, empower us through your spirit to guide us to the people that you've placed in our lives that you want us to talk to, that you want us to have conversations that are full of love, full of grace, full of mercy even, and forgiveness and reconciliation. And the reason why we know that we have to do it in that way is because that is how you treat us. That's how you speak to us, Lord, and that's changed everything for your church. Lord, help us to be selfless as we move towards the people that you have placed in our heart to pray for that don't know you yet. May we passionately and joyfully share the good news of Christ, whatever it may look like, so that we represent you well and we honor what your word tells us to do in its fullness, that others may be attracted to who you are and the hope that we have in you so that their lives can be transformed as well. So thank you, Lord, for your word this morning, and may you receive all the honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, we'll be uh, partaking in the Lord's Supper together, and Pastor Daryl will lead us in that. You know, Jesus, Jesus had a conversation with his disciples, and this is what he said to them. <clears throat> well, what Paul said about that. Before I received from the Lord, I pass on to you on that night he was betrayed. The Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So they had that conversation. Do this in remembrance of me as you look at the bread. The same way he also took the cup. After supper, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So again, it was the same conversation. And actually... Um, he says, for as often as you, you eat this bread and drink this cup, you'll proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So it really is the gospel, isn't it? He's talking, that's about the gospel right there. So he had a gospel conversation with his disciples before he died. And we are called to do that same thing. But this morning, we want to remember our Lord, remember the gospel, and remember that we have, it's our responsibility to be the salt and light. So I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward. Those of you who have been baptized, if you believe the Lord and been baptized, you're, 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 it's, you are um, open to partake. If you haven't been baptized, we actually just refrain from this. Um, so we're going to pray, and then you, and, and when you feel ready, you come and take a cup, uh, and you, you, take the, you take it back, and then you take it on your own, okay? So this time we won't take it together. But let's pray, and then um, um, we need to examine ourselves this morning. Father, when you start to remember you, that means that we got to remember that you're the Lord. You're the one who died for us, who, who rose again so that we could have life if we trust you. And then to be obedient to you being by being baptized. And so, Lord, we want to remember you this morning. We want to remember that someone had a conversation with us, with us so that we could know you. And, Lord, we just pray for this, this week that you, as you open up, opportunities that we would have time to speak and share, yeah, that you died and you rose again for everyone. Forgive us the times that we have not, we have failed you, um, and thank you for forgiving us. So we ask you bless the elements, Lord, this morning and our time with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So when you're ready, just come and receive
Hello. Thank you, Mark, for the message. Uh, we're going to sing God So Loved as our response song. We're going to season John 3.16 with some salt and some rhythm. My bad. That was really cheesy. If you're a... Uh, if you'd like to stand with us, uh, feel free. If you'd like to sit as well, that's okay. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never ends dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that He gave us is one and only Son to save us forever leaves in Him We'll live forever Bring all your failures, bring your addictions Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us who ever believes Him will live forever. The power of defeated now it is well I'm walking in freedom for God so love God so love the world Lord thank you so much that you give us the ability to speak to talk and to interact with other people may our words be salted and seasoned with salt. Lord, we ask that you continue to finish what you started in us by your grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise